Luke Schaefer, I am so honored to be in conversation with you. Congratulations on being named the Herman and Omalia Cohn Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, Celeste. I really appreciate you taking the time um, to talk about this and be here with me. Absolutely. So this professorship is part of a larger initiative called the Cone Collaborative. Can you tell us more about it, its history and what it aims to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. This comes out of a partnership with Hal and Carol Cohn, um, who have connected with the Ford School on their interest in both rigorous research uh, that really uses the cutting edge methods to learn more about the world, learn more about um, how policies work, and then to build on that knowledge by doing something about it and really impacting the work at the world in, in significant ways. So uh, when I first got to know Hal and Carol early on, they're um, just incredibly wonderful people, uh, very generous uh, in so many ways. They talked about uh, wanting to use this gift to, to help lift up the voice, the voices of the voiceless in mm. so many ways. And in fact, my prefer professorship, the Herman and Amalia Cohn professorship, is named after Hal's grandparents who perished. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, they perished as, um, um, during the Holocaust. Mm. And so uh, wanting to honor them and wanting their uh, legacy to live on, and through that to uh, partner with the Ford School on a set of uh, professorships that would really uh, lift up the voices of those who often uh, don't have voices at the table. So there'll be a set of professorships, there'll be a set of um, support for students, and then a set of resources through the Cone Collaborative that'll be about policy impact and will be about trying to um, help bring the, the voices of our faculty uh, and their knowledge into policy making discussions. Uh, and when we think about this um, voice voice for the voiceless, mm -hmm. so many times in policy making discussions, those who are sort of being treated or impacted, they don't have any voice uh, at the table right. or, or not as much as they should. And um, Celeste, uh, I've been thinking about your award-winning book, uh, Remaking a Life, which is about the HIV safety net and and how that might be a sort of a counterexample of uh, sort of a safety net that was built that really did have uh, elements of empowerment. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, you spoke to one of the core elements of remaking a life and how this kind of work is connected to the work of the Cone Collaborative. And that is the idea of um, hearing the voices of people who have often been historically silenced. And part of my work is studying the HIV epidemic. This is an epidemic that disproportionately affects affects marginalized communities, sexual minorities, LGBTQ populations, people of color, low income individuals. And in order for us to build a response to the HIV epidemic that was so frightening and continues to be quite frightening, there had to be voices that were traditionally marginalized that were brought in to talk about lived experience, to talk about what was important to be able to fight the HIV epidemic, what resources, what policy tools, what priorities would we need in order to effectively mount a response to this epidemic? So we had to listen to voices that too often we did not listen to, we did not seek counsel from. And when you look at the history of the HIV epidemic, you see the ways in which LGBTQ populations were heavily involved in creating the HIV response. And we also must note, and I talk about it in my book, that it was actually quite a diverse coalition who mm -hmm. came to become the HIV, who came to uh, be the HIV community. People of color were involved. Um, low income folks were involved and we often have one image of what HIV activism looked, looks like, but in fact, it's, it's quite multicultural and multifaceted. And through those multitude of voices and ideas and um, experiences, mm -hmm. the HIV community was able to politically mobilize and to talk to policy officials about what the needs were and to build what I call one of the most effective safety nets that we've built in the last 40 years. And that's the HIV safety net. The 
uh, amalgamation of healthcare resources for people living with HIV, including uh, HIV drug assistance, um, access to economic assistance for those who need it, uh, social support, bringing to people together of shared experiences to support each other, to share information, to share networks. And then finally, to, to empower people to, to become political agents, to provide those on ramps to civic engagement, to ask people living with HIV to tell their stories, to inform the public, to inform political officials. And that proved to be quite important, that HIV community, that HIV safety net, for the women that I studied who were living with HIV, women who often had been counted out, hadn't been given appropriate resources, had been underserved for so long, had been grappling with what it means to live under deep structural and institutional inequities. Um, finally, many of them ironically had access to a community and to resources through their work in the HIV safety net. By no means are we suggesting um, that HIV is a quote unquote good, Ill, good diagnosis as some people might be hearing what I'm saying. But instead, what I'm saying is despite the difficulty of the diagnosis, the threat to one's health, the threat to one's social stability, the stigma that people grapple with. There was nevertheless a safety net that caught people and supported them and continues to support them in all kinds of different ways as they grapple with not only a very serious health diagnosis, but also all of the inequities that led to the diagnosis in the first place. So what's amazing about this Cone Collaborative is the ways in which it centers the idea of thinking about social policy and social justice in intertwined ways, the way it centers hearing from and thinking about and including marginalized populations in how we formate, formulate public policy, and also to think about how do we engage students, how do we engage faculty, um, and how do we engage the broader community in this work? So this is very exciting, Luke, and I can't think of a, a more appropriate person to be leading us in this initiative, to have a named professorship as part of this initiative, and to really be at the forefront of helping to visualize what the possibilities are and what this looks like and how we can be the most effective we can be with this very, very generous gift from the Cone family. Celeste, uh, I love some, you just, uh, in your discussion of remaking a life, you just mentioned so many of the things that I think are important to the Cones and that I have been trying to live out in my own work, uh, really yeah. starting with listening, bringing the, um, sort of the, the folks who are vulnerable and who are being uh, treated by policy or healthcare system to the table and then bringing evidence to the table and then really sort of grounding us in the fact that when we do that, uh, we can make a difference. We can create, we cre can create systems that really uh, enhance lives and uh, empower people to live healthy and productive lives. And, um, you know, I remember uh, our mutual friend uh, and colleague, Kathy Eden. Yes, when I, yes. When I first started working with her on $2 a day, uh, it really took me in a different sort of uh, a path on my research trajectory of um, uh, I had been doing a lot of work um, primarily with uh, data in my office. And I think that was really important work. Um, but uh, when I got to know Kathy and uh, you know her research technology was to go out and talk to people, um, I really found that having those two types of research uh, in conversation with one another can be extremely powerful. And I feel like I can learn more um, about what I'm you know exploring than I ever could else otherwise. So, uh, one example, as I got to know families who were extremely poor, were really, really poor, and particularly had no cash, um, we would see this little uh, divot on the inside crease uh, of the elbow of the moms. And uh, as we started to talk to them about how they made ends meet, what did they do to survive when they didn't have any money, they might have food assistance, but no cash coming in. We learned that those divots were scars from selling their blood plasma so mm -hmm. often. Um, and so that was something where, you know, I, I've been 
named in the press as a as a poverty expert before that, but I, I had I didn't know anything about uh, selling blood plasma. And mm -hmm. then it turns out, you know, as we go back to the data at that point, we'd had a seen a tripling in the number of people selling their blood plasma. Uh, we've now learned that plasma centers, you know, target uh, very vulnerable communities, and that it's a um, a, a very large industry. And yes. so just grappling with that, right, and sort of deepening the understanding of what um, the world looks like, um, just, you know, really enriched my ability to, to, to do any sort of research. And then um, bringing that forward to Poverty Solutions, our, our model at Poverty Solutions is really to start with listening mm -hmm. and then bring evidence uh, to try to find solutions. Um, and that means we often end up studying things we might never have expected that we would have mm -hmm. studied uh, in the first place. So, um, you know, uh, it's well known that affordable housing is a, a major challenge that people have um, in finding stable, you know, decent housing. Um, in Detroit, that really takes the form of tax foreclosure, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, we've seen a huge part of the housing stock loss to tax foreclosure. So mm -hmm. getting into the nuts and bolts of that, um, we only started to do when we uh, started working deeply in the community and starting with listening and finding out how were people losing their homes? What was, um, how were they being impacted? And then we've even studied things like auto insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, again, when I uh, started this work, I never would have met, that wouldn't have been in my hundred top things, you know, as oh. we're trying to help people succeed, but it was really uh, a concern that was incredibly um, deep uh, in the city because it has the highest auto insurance rates in the country. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I found that this type of work that I think your, your book really embodies mm -hmm. um, can take us in directions we might never have expected to go and yeah. can help us learn um, and then create systems that can work better, that can really empower families. Right. I think that's so important, Luke. And I, I just want to underscore your point about listening first. Um, because I think that that is such a critical and underutilized tool in research, but also in philanthropy. I think people often decide, well, here's what's necessary and um, kind of charge in. And what's so beautiful about the work that you do in your research and the work that I do in terms of listening to women living with HIV um, and really trying to understand both the struggles that they're describing, but also the importance of the HIV safety net in their lives and their really strong assertions about its importance and being able to hold both things in, in one's hand at the same time. So on the one hand, through listening, we're able to uncover really important details about the social world and your work on blood plasma. Um, we are co-advising you and I, a graduate student, Annalise Ochoa, who is now working on that topic. Um, and it, it's so critically important in terms of how far it stretches and the ways in which it operates um, in many ways invisible to so many of us, but is so critical mm -hmm. to others of us. Um, but that ability to listen and then use that to guide the inquiry is so important. And then you see it in philanthropy. You see the way in which for the for the Cone Collaborative, this deep listening in terms of how do we best think about policy influence and using scholarship for policy influence and and how do we build something that is really going to make a difference and then working collaboratively with um, the members of the Ford School community to kind of imagine together to to uh, to think about what this would look like. I think it's a it's very interesting in terms of the parallel process that happens that's grounded in listening. And um, to really lift that up as an important principle and an important value in all of the work that's happening, both the larger Cone Collaborative, but also um, the individual research that we do as scholars. Well, Celeste, yeah. this is a treat. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. And I have to say, Luke, you know, whenever we talk, I always learn something. Um, I always leave inspired and encouraged and you are doing, you know, from the work on blood plasma to auto insurance to tax foreclosures, the work that you are doing is so impactful 
for people. And what I love about it is, you know, when we were trained in graduate school, there were certain topics that graduate students were encouraged to focus on. And there wasn't often a lot of creativity involved. And there wasn't sometimes a lot of listening involved. It was always, this is what we do, right, as scholars interested in inequality. And what you have done throughout your career is to flip that, to think about the unanswered questions, the topics that seem off the beaten path, but end up being integral to the day-to-day -day lives of marginalized populations. And that really are often policy areas that are unspoken, um, but that nevertheless have huge impacts on the day-to-day -day lives of individuals. So um, someone just writing a check for auto insurance and lamenting the cost, mm -hmm. turns out it tells us a lot about how inequality is operating within a particular urban context. Um, so thank you for the creativity that you bring as one of the key values of your of your work as well. And congratulations again on um, your work with the Cone Collaborative and congratulations on being the Herman and Omalia Cone Professor of Social Justice and Social Policy. I'm so, so, so proud of you. Oh, Celeste, you, uh, uh, you really just made my, uh, made my day, made my week. Um, I really appreciate that. And it was a, uh, just a wonderful day for the Ford School uh, when you joined us. I'm, I'm so delighted to be your colleague and feel exactly the same way that I learn things every time and I'm inspired by your creativity and your, and your thoughtfulness. And um, just so glad to be your colleague. Uh, and Hal and Carol, uh, just um, taking a second to say thank you. Thank you for your partnership. Uh, I feel uh, personally, I feel so um, energized by your partnership and so supported by it. And I know the Ford School does. And I think together we're all going to really build something uh, very, very exciting.